Hello, Marcus. It's so nice to see you. Mariana, very sweet that we're meeting today. Very sweet. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to um, start asking questions about drama therapy and expressive arts. <laughs> and I would like to do some questions. So uh, it's for, uh, for everyone that is interested in theater and in expressive arts and also in psychodrama, psychodrama. So uh, I will begin. Are you ready? <laughs> sure. Okay. Okay, Marcus, what is the definition uh, of drama therapy? <laughs> well, I suppose it depends on your history. I mean, my history of drama therapy is oh, pretty specific. My first career was as an actor, so I use a lot of the theater games and exercises and sensitivity training I learned as an actor. Um, and some of the things I learned about improvisation and, you know, sort of exercises to be more spontaneous. So I, especially as an expressive arts therapist and educator, um, I'm arts based, you know, so sort of the art of theater or the art of acting, you know, like any art form, uh, start with the art form and be less concerned with technique, you know, the classic expressive arts thing in drama also, low skill, high sensitivity with a little bit of skill and being able to improvise, for example, uh, something very magical can happen. Okay, and what about a phenomenology? How do you, can how can you add that into theater, for example? Beautifully. Uh, uh, the question in phenomenology is, what are you noticing? So, yeah, so all of these, all of the actors' training was to increase our sensitivity um, and to our quality of presence, our ability to respond freshly. So this question, this phenomenological question, what are you noticing, is an ongoing question in theater and drama, especially in improvisation. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, phenomenology precedes um, drama as a therapy, this idea of use what you can to help whoever you, you're working with to notice in their particular way. Uh, so drama therapy may not be for everyone, but I, I think uh, it's so playful uh, so that when you're asking a phenomenological question, like, what are you noticing? Uh, especially for beginners, it doesn't have to be, what are you feeling? Because that can be, you know, maybe they don't know what they're feeling or it's too scary right then. But just what are you noticing? They might say, I notice I really feel my feet on the floor. <laughs> and, you know, of course, that's great. Uh, for, for actors training, you're actually you know, planted in the present. Okay, so something came up, uh, I mean... Uh, being a director or a phenomenologist that that comes to uh, a conversation with the actor, so to say, you can also uh, see the movements that they make. How how can you uh, express that to the other so that the other became more present? Or, I mean, you you've said use what you can, but in in terms of movement and body language. What's the, the, the terms? Are there terms, special terms about seeing someone moves and also uh, saying about uh, saying something about that? Yes. Um, maybe with people just beginning, I might have more pointed questions like um, or comments like, I notice that you tend to like to move quickly. Or I notice that you're more comfortable with more slow motion. Uh, or I notice that you kind of lead with your head. Interesting. You know, without it being a judgment, you know. So uh, to feedback what I'm noticing and to ask them, so what did you notice just now in this little 15-minute improvisation? 
And they might say, I noticed that I was scared to move to the center of the room. I kept gravitating off to the side. And at one point I said, Don, just stand there in the middle of the room. So that moment I just stood there and I only stood there, I felt really empowered. I say, yeah, great, tell me more about that. They said, oh, I felt my heart open up. I'm standing there in the center of the room or the center of the stage. And I thought, yes, I have to take my space. And maybe they cry and say, yes, I have to take my space. And to just know when to be quiet and let them feel their response to um, do the work, to the... So you invite them into something we might call drama therapy from an expressive arts phenomenological perspective. But the I think the important time in that is right after it, where they feel the effects of it and maybe what we're going for is not only an insight, who had an insight that I'm afraid to take center stage, but a shift that they actually feel in their body. Ah, oh, it's okay to take the space and maybe more crying or something. And so that time after uh, the exploration, feeling effects of it is so much a part of what makes it not just drama, but expressive arts therapy. So there's that marriage of drama where you do something, an improvisation or something, and then take the expressive arts perspective and say, okay, take some time to feel the effects. Okay, so thank you. There are two parts, the part of improvisation, playing, engaging, and that, that that's where the drama therapy came. And then you make a pause or silence until the person feels it so to say, and then you uh, enter a new space, and from then it, it, it uh, the expressive arts uh, take the role, so to say, and that's mm -hmm. when the conversations begin, and the, the people can also um, notice uh, their resources. I want to uh, talk more about that. How can you, uh, for example, a turn a movement or turn a character or turn your body language and or your sounds into resources into resources i mean how how can you be empowered about them how how can you build that bridge who helps to do that the therapist or the the pay or the the expert the patient how how does it work well, because I'm working so in such a body-centered way, when I'm working with someone, I very seldom have a goal. I'm working more like, do you sense where you're coming from? And are you aware of what's nurturing about what we're doing? So it's a kind of a return to what precedes anxiety, efforting, uh, trying, and um, working with uh, what Eugene Janlin famously called the felt sense, the felt sense of where you're coming from. And so to use the, the sort of expressive arts oriented drama therapy to have a, a more visceral, more embodied sense of Who's moving in space? You know, what, what, where am I coming from? And that kind of, not only the, does it set a trajectory into the improvisational movement or whatever you're doing, it sets a trajectory into their lives that have more resonance with that kind of springboard of where they're coming from and to take their hands off, especially at the beginning for where we're going. And as an educator and a therapist, it's very important for me not to have some idea of where they should be going, and but to help them strengthen their resonance of where they're coming from. And so many of the, the acting exercises and the drama work have to do with having a more embodied sense of that sort of vertical energy, establishing this before you move into the horizontal energy, which is so the interplay with, with others and with space, so it's important sort of in the, uh, technically speaking, in terms of when you start with a client or, or a student within the frame of expressive arts, to kind of establish find, finding uh, theater games and um, 
and drama therapy exercises that are more to sort of establish this this energy, this presence, this vertical energy, before moving into more improvisational things that are more in the horizontal plane, which is a parallel to how to be in life. You know, before you take a step, you know, strengthen your resonance with your core and then move that core around in the world so you don't lose yourself. Oh, that's a uh, very beautiful. Uh... I mean, what I what I'm getting is that you go to your your sun, <laughs> your prof profundity, and then the light comes up. <laughs> so Beautiful. it's the the first the first part is you, and then the others and the space and the world. So uh, I think I think this is very important uh, to know where you are, where are you grounded, you no, know? uh, and and also that takes a lot of exercise, you no, know, and therapy as well and and a process no and the process in yourself you no know, to discover all that kind of um what resides in you what but but what what you are uh, what your specialties are and your languages and and and, and all the <laughs> the stuff that we have <laughs> uh, around us inside of us and that's a a training i mean that's not easy but i think it's it's very important to do this step and then the other step no so okay so let's talk about the second question about what tools uh, does drama therapy give us you know you know me mari amaso you know that i'm interested in deep play and to you know so i think what drama therapy does is it takes care of both uh, the letting go let go let go let go but it's not enough um drama therapy is about how to let go and to shape that how to you know it's not enough to be inspired but you also need the skill to shape it so expressive arts therapy within the frame of drama therapy does the same as all the other art forms in that we create a frame for people to relax and open and explore with just a little bit of skill to to shape that letting go, uh, to move into um, playful theater games or uh, improvisation, whatever it is, with giving them just enough suggestions for technique, just a little bit for them to really um, risk moving into new territory. That's what acting's about. I remember I was about 15 or 16 when I started in theater. And um, the director said to me, well, when a person leaves the theater, they should feel different, that their lives have changed. I'm like, wow, that's a big thing. And the same thing with um, when we were working with drama therapy, um, the, this thing that I re refer to as a shift, like, oh, I'm less afraid to play. I'm less afraid to let go. Thanks for teaching me this idea of you let go, but also learn how to, how to shape it, um, whether it's movement or voice or some combination. We are helping to build skill like any art form, that increases the chances that the client will take some risks and move into new spaces. They move into new spaces and then just, just enough skill building to shape how they're being in these new spaces, to build confidence that they can, what we've been calling for years, expanding the play range. So I'd say the heart of what drama therapy can do is what Paolo Knell called for years, expanding the play range. Oh, that's amazing. And what would you call that a new place, new territory? Is imagination, is the liminal space, uh, it, it, is another lo it has another logic. Can you describe uh, that place where we enter when we do that, all that playing, after we do that, all that playing? Well, we're in a new here and now, a new here and now that might feel quieter, 
simpler, more safe. When we enter into the, the exploration itself, something magical can happen. Of course, that's what we call the third. Something, what is this that's opening up and you step into it and you're in a very extraordinary place. But our work is not how to stay in that extraordinary. We open up the space for a while through the improv or whatever we're doing with drama, and they go into some very extraordinary level of imagination and play. But then, as therapists, it's then to take them back to the ordinary life, where they still have to take out the garbage and walk the dog and pay the bills, <laughs> but to do ordinary things in an unordinary way because their senses are waking up. Uh, that's, you know, I noticed as a young person that the the theater games and, and all the acting lessons and all that was really making me so able to use my sensitivity. I was a sensitive young person, but what theater and theater games and drama and all of that gave me was a way to channel that sensitivity to say, oh, it's so good to be sensitive to how I'm stepping in or how I'm stepping back or the, the tone of my voice. And I'd open up these extraordinary places where my sensitivity came alive. But then I needed to learn how to then go back to everyday life so that that sensitivity doesn't work against me, but that I'm that I'm not victimized by becoming more sensitive, but oh, I, now I'm even more sensitive, but I know how to, to take care of it a little bit more, how to move, how to move in life. So again, that structure of yes, open up the extraordinary through the play, but then work with the client to teach them how to go back to the ordinary in an unordinary way and ask them, what are you noticing? Oh, I just noticing that uh, I'm a little lighter in my step when I move in the world now. And what else, you know, what are you noticing? How is it showing up? This, this beautiful, playful thing we did, how is it affecting your everyday life? So that structure from the extraordinary into the ordinary in an unordinary way because of the heightened uh, experience of our senses, our ability to respond. Okay, so you enter that new here and now, and then you have to, uh, with that, that you've experienced there, then you have to go back to everyday life where your reality is. And the, the accompaniment that the people does, the people that is shaping, you know, the, the, the therapist that is shaping, has to be also phenomen a phenomenal, in a phenomenological way, or it's another language? Quite phenomenological. Um, um, I'll say things like what touched you and what did you learn? And while there is a psychological element, I invite them when I say what touched you um, to be phenomenological. Like I noticed that when I put my head down, it wasn't because I was ashamed. It was because I needed to take a moment to listen to my heart. Where they take a breath and I say, oh, so maybe during the day when you get a little frustrated or distracted, you could take a moment, put your head down a little bit, take a deep breath and come back to that place that you discovered of that inner peace, you know. So I'm building on what did you notice? So I don't have a technique that's the same for everybody. Through the improv, they give uh, something to work with. So we're not working on issues with them. Oh, we can do this to, to take care of that issue. Oh, you're shy? Oh, I have some techniques for shyness. But it's so, you know, if a person says they're shy, I'll go to the phenomenological. They say, well, that's kind of general. Can you tell me a little bit more about the nature of your shyness so we have something to work with rather than work on? Okay, so that's when you start to connect the connections start there, you know, when you notice something you 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 were noticing uh, before, and uh, the other person, the therapist, gives you the the space to speak about that, and 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 you can also uh, be aware of it. Perhaps you know it, but you weren't aware of it, and in that time, perhaps you can uh, discover something about yourself, about your everyday life, and I think th this part is very important because when there's no enough time, for example, in the session and you leave 
uh, a little bit for that part, then it's very. <laughs> um, so what do you, what do you, can you give us advice how to enter that realm of 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 knowledge when you turn from your imagination to the world? I mean, in a phenomenological way, but you have to acknowledge to let people acknowledge what they're what they felt and and make also the connections to everyday life so um, yes. that needs time and space no? yes. well as an educator i've always personally liked being transparent and talking my process and that's how i work also as a therapist and encourage uh, my students to to be to talk their process say okay um we have an hour and uh, 40, now it's at 40 minutes, we have 20 minutes, and I would now like to shift our focus from our art making, from our this, this wonderful improvisation we just did, take a deep breath and let's give some thought to its practical landing in your life. I'm wondering if we can start to look at how what's happening here within the frame of our work is affecting your everyday life. So, so I might say to them, so just pay attention between now and the next time I see you to see if you have any sense that what happened today, and I might give an example, like your ability to laugh at yourself for being so serious about everything. If that moment then, did it show up? If it's, let's see if it shows up. And to make it clear to them that I have a structure when I do a therapy session in any art form. I use the first third to kind of get into it. Where are they at? I wonder what modality we'll use today. Okay, we could use drama. I'll get them on their feet. And then the middle third to actually work. And the last third for, for reflection to say, so what touched you? Uh, what's your takeaway from today? What do you want to remember? That last third is very important. I never, and I, I don't mean never, I never stop the art making at the end of the session. I always leave enough time for the very important part of what makes it expressive arts therapy, which is the time to feel the effects of, of the work. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, your educative part from for all the therapists that I've seen uh, how is uh, and the next question will be how does drama therapy contribute to human development how does it not it contributes in every way because it's about um two things mostly our ability to be aware keeps us and everyone around us safe if you're not aware you're unsafe for yourself and everyone around you. What this work in expressive arts, and we're naming now particularly the drama therapy work, I call it the evolution of conscious awareness. So I'm aware, and then I start to be conscious of when I'm aware and when I'm not aware. I wouldn't call it the witness, I would just say another level of awareness that's conscious. Ha ha, I really wanted to step back and I didn't. I really wanted to lean in at that moment, but I froze. And so the the, the process, you, you might do a sort of a what we call the aesthetic analysis of say the improv. And the person might say, hmm, interesting. I do that in life. You know, I really want to lean in and I get scared and I freeze, or I really know I should lean back and have a larger perspective, and I don't. So maybe through these theater games and improv, whatever we're doing, within a safe frame, a person can have that, what I'm calling the evolution of conscious awareness. Aha, I didn't see that before. Or, oh, that's, wow, that feels different, you know? And then to say, so take that shift of increase, of conscious awareness into your everyday life. And the next time I see you, let me know if there was any of those moments when you froze or you said, no, I'm going to lean in here at this moment. So there's a 
a very real uh, relationship between what happens within the frame of the therapeutic process in drama, where there's, oh, huh, that's interesting, which of course is what you love to hear when you're working phenomenologically. Just, oh, hmm. Yeah. I, I personally don't work for catharsis. I know some ways of working are, are for, for catharsis, but personally, I like those little, hmm, <clears throat> the tiny, hmm, that's interesting. And give them time to really feel it kind of, hmm. And see the, the practical application of that little, hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. And you've you've uh, told something, tell something about uh, the diffic difficulty and how to overcome it. I mean, in the process, you find yourself uh, in front of a difficulty, or I, I, I mean, I froze, I couldn't move, and and how does that work to acknowledge your res your resource? I mean, it's a process. How how does that work? Until the person knows, okay, I can overcome my, I overcame my difficult, difficult, difficulty. Yeah, well, you know, Einstein said that there's no such thing as an objective experiment. Whoever's holding it changes it. So I work with how are you holding yourself? How are you holding this moment? How are you being with your difficulty? How are you? just saying i'm in a struggle and not struggle over your struggle as the the buddhists say don't struggle over your struggle mm -hmm. the kindness and the intelligence which which with which they can accompany themselves uh, the metaphor i would use is that they're not only awakening the dancer they're awakening the choreographer that says sweetheart go to the center of the stage or, okay, now you can just sort of step off stage. Beautiful. Or the director that says, give me more fire, stay with it. Give me more fire, you know, to, to work with the metaphor of dancer and choreographer and actor and director so that uh, we're not only able to embody our truth, but that evolution of conscious awareness that that's, that's the choreographer and the director saying, um, take it easy or go for it. Uh, and uh, the ability to have a good relationship between the dancer and the choreographer or the actor and the direct director, feeling like I have such a good relationship. I really listen and trust my choreographer. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of a metaphor for them not becoming dependent on me, but it's my job to set a frame where I awaken that director choreographer in them. Okay, so that's amazing what you tell about uh, the relationship has to do with also with bonding. I mean, it's a process, right? You have to be with a person more than once to create that. <laughs> or how, how do you, can you address that? Yeah. Uh, well, Mariana, I would say that a person can have a shift and they say, okay, I got it. And it, it doesn't have to be a process. They could just say, okay, I see that I've been unkind. And that's enough of that. They can have a very quick shift. And then it's gradually embodying that clarity. Like it is so clear to me that I've been unkind to myself in that area. Wow, it is absolutely clear. I am so done with that. And so it's all at once and gradual. I got it. And then for it to sort of land in the cells and in their, their everyday lives, it's a process. So we stay with them and we remind them how to come back to that more honest, congruent sense of um, what's, what's really not working, that unkindness. It, it isn't working for you, is it? Clearly not. So, and then to say, oh yes, I, I yesterday I had a moment where I was really mean to myself and very judging, and I I shifted so quickly before it might have taken me days, and now I noticed in about fifteen minutes I said, okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> okay, thanks.
So the last two uh, one questions has to do uh, about your experience of uh, the theater theater lab that you made uh, that you mentioned in your book. Uh, what can you tell us about creative processes in dance theater and how do you came to that idea, that amazing idea? <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I didn't write my doctoral dissertation in, until I was working for many years. And it's, I wrote it because an opportunity came up that I said, oh, good, this is a, a perfect lab for me to write my dissertation, which then eventually became that book, Expressive Arts, Education and Therapy. But it was initially my, my dissertation. And then I worked on it for another year for it to be a book. Um, so uh, I had the opportunity to be artist in residence at the university here in the city I live in. I'm in Edmonton, Canada. And it was the University of Alberta. And I, I was invited to be artist in residence as director choreographer. So I found 24 non-dancers, non-actors, you know. And my question was, how does creating a dance theater ensemble, what teach us about how to create healthy community? What are the essential elements of a healthy community? And what are some of the things that, when I was an ensemble actor for years and it felt so healthy and so joyous and I, I couldn't wait to get to rehearsal and the, the performances were just so joyful. You know, none of that stage fright or am I good enough? The ensemble attitude of encouraging and supporting each other, being responsive, creating an, an environment that felt so nurturing and safe and ex exploring, that's what we did. Um, we created an environment that was so kind and and curious. So after we worked for a while, I had everybody make some notes, you know, what do you want to remember from our time together? And then we got together uh, after the three months and small groups in my home and, and they wrote, um, from what they wrote, we had kind of a Q and A and sort of harvested. And and then I wrote the book that sort of looks at all of the gifts that came of those three months together and the three months afterward of harvesting. So then it took me three years to go through the hundreds of pages that were transcribed because everything was recorded and transcribed. So I went through it and I created a, what an expressive arts, what we call, which I mentioned earlier, an aesthetic analysis. What happened that created safety? What happened that created openness? And I realized that each moment was very rich with what I was seeing as a director choreographer of so many subtleties of what we call relaxed. I thought, oh my gosh, because they went into this extraordinary time of so relaxed that their ability to be fluid and playful was much higher than their everyday selves. So that, so that the dance theater frame became a way for, for people to relax so much and move into a very fluid, spontaneous space uh, that then they could say, I like that better. I want to bring this into my life. So I would say, ironically, it was such a simple thing that we found that was essential in order for there to be safety, in order for there to be playfulness, is to relax and feel like, oh, I can just be me here. And to start to laugh and, and do things that they hadn't done before again, because these were not trained actors and dancers. And it, it just opened up a, a space of, of play that increase their ability to go back into their everyday lives in a more playful, spontaneous way. And I will say that relaxing was the thing that sort of set the tone for so much creativity. It's hard to be creative if you're not relaxed. So then, I, you know, I've been bringing that to this 
to the work of expressive arts in how to build community. And kind of like first things first. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marcus. That was all, thank you for all your contribution. And it was very nice to hear from you as well. Great. Well, uh, thanks for this opportunity to uh, spend some time with you. We haven't seen each other in three years. We've talked some, but it's very sweet to, to sort of connect this way. And uh, I do appreciate your wanting to go finer and finer in asking the question, what works? And I'm so glad you're staying with this work. Uh, uh, you have so much heart for it and the intelligence to think about, hmm, you know, I love this and I want to get better at, at, at offering things that are truly useful to people. So thank you so much for, for today's uh, talk and I wish you the best with, uh, I know these wonderful projects that you're in now.